I'm an average man. And I am an average woman. One thing about being the average man, leading the primitive life, it gives you plenty of time for thinking. My wife thinks a lot. It's true. Although we're living 10,000 years ago, I do think a lot, but then so does he. Though being average, he only thinks average thoughts. In fact, we're both so average, sometimes we think the same average thoughts, so we don't even bother to speak to each other. Hmm. You know, I could tell you precisely what she's thinking now. She's thinking, what would it be like to move forward 10,000 years in time and live in the 21st century? Oh, <gasps> what's that? Oh. Oh. oh, it's a time machine. Oh, oh crikey. Oh. Look at that. Hey. Oh. Hello? Oh. 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 What's that? Oh. Oh. Hey, look. What are those? Those things he's holding. They look like square bits of... I, 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 I don't know. It, it's all so complicated. Oh. What's that? I don't know. Hey, they seem to be doing things for each other all the time. And everybody seems to be depending on those little pieces of... Oh, no, look. They were round. Those. Was she going to eat that? Oh, hey, they look just like us. Well, except they're wearing those funny clothes. I wonder if they think like us. I bet they do. He's thinking, how did we get into this amazing state of affairs? Wouldn't it be lovely to have lived 10,000 years ago, before life got so complicated? Yeah, and she's thinking, what was it like 10,000 years ago when there were no banks, no factories or offices, no post offices or mobiles or computers, no shops or supermarkets? In fact, what would it be like to be us? I bet they got it all wrong. I bet they think it must have been paradise 10,000 years ago with nothing to do all day long except enjoy themselves. Mm, that's right. They think we spend all day getting a nice suntan, <laughs> feasting on the bounty of nature. When he wants something to eat, all he has to say is... Is lunch ready? Oh, coming, dear. I bet he thinks he's completely independent of everybody else. Yeah, and that he's his own master. Oh dear, they've got a lot to learn. I suppose they'd imagine a community of folk, like us, living 10,000 years ago, in a wooded valley, cut off from the rest of the world by high mountains. Mm, the folk in Happy Valley, they call us. <laughs> Just the life, really. Enough work for everybody who wants it. No inflation. <laughs> who ever heard of inflation when there's no money? Yeah. And no problems of one person having more than the other. Everybody here is absolutely equal because everybody is in the same boat. Yeah, and in the same conga line. Woohoo! <laughs> oh, yes, life is so wonderful here, isn't it? So easy and playful and happy. And that's how they think it was, if only they knew the reality. For a start, there's no machinery here to help us grow food. Everything is done by the painful sweat of the brow of you-know-who. And you-know-who. Mm. Have you ever tried rubbing away at poor soil baked like concrete by the sun? Come on, get on with it. Oh, you get on with it. Oh. Poor kids, they flaked out. Get on with it, I said. You want to eat, don't you? Oh. The back-breaking jobs you have to do just to keep alive. And you'll have to be doing them over and over again, year in, year out, till your dying day. And then one day some people think, oh, there must be a better way of life than this. There will be those who say, but we've always lived like this. My father and his father before him lived like this. Well, that's no reason for going on the same way forever and ever. Uh, sometimes there doesn't seem to be much choice. Until you think about it. The fact is, life can be rough and it can be short. Suppose somebody's taken ill. Well, there's certainly no nurse or doctor just around the corner. When somebody gets sick... They die. The average age a man can expect to live to is only about 30. Many children die very young. The truth is, Happy Valley is threatened in lots of ways. <gasps> Get up quick!
quick. Oh, go back to sleep. Get up, get up, get up. I, I know I heard something, I did. There's something outside. Go back to sleep. Oh. You're always imagining oh. things. Oh. 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 It's, a, it's, it's a wolf. I told you. It's a wolf. Oh. Oh. And that's how it is. When wild animals raid the valley's livestock, it's a major disaster. The animals can't be replaced overnight. Where would they get them from? There are no markets, remember? And then winter comes, and everybody has to live on grain or the few root vegetables they've managed to save from the summer harvest, if they're lucky. And that's all there is to last until spring. Don't worry. It's bound to be a mild winter. I can feel it in my bones. In a bad year, there's no surplus to put by. They have to rely on what's dug out of the frozen earth, if anything. And if you're really unlucky, that can mean starvation. Hmm, a mild winter, you said. Don't worry. It won't last. You'll see. Mm -hmm. But somehow or other, people did survive. After all, we couldn't be here talking about them if they hadn't, could we? Well, that's true. And we had everything. Snow, floods, wild animals. Uh -huh. Yet we survived. Still, there was one thing we didn't have much of. What's that? Choice. Mm -hmm. For instance, they can't choose one job in preference to another. They just do whatever's necessary to stay alive. And they do it hour in, hour out, day in, day out, week in, week out. This way of living is called a subsistence economy. It needs all the efforts of every able-bodied member of the community just to stay the way they are now. And there's nothing to spare for anyone else. Anything they don't need for themselves today, they keep for themselves tomorrow. And all this isn't just a piece of history or a bit of imagination. It all happened thousands of years ago. It's true. And it's still happening today. For real. You know, about a quarter of all the people in the world today live on less than one dollar a day. They produce barely enough for their basic daily needs, and sometimes not even that. In a poor country like this, for instance, approximately 95% of all adults work on the land. They're very poor and their lives are very hard. Of course, there are always those at the top who do very nicely, even in a country like this, but most are constantly threatened by disease and famine. People like this are essentially living like their ancestors. They're on the very bottom of the economic ladder. They're one step above extinction. 95% of the population of many developing countries work to produce food just for themselves, and that leaves hardly anybody else to produce other goods and services. In Britain, only about 1% of the people work in agriculture, but more than half the food we eat is produced on our own farms. In the US, just 2% of the population are farmers, or farm workers, and they produce enough to feed the remaining 98% of the American population, with enough left over to export vast quantities to the rest of the world. An American farmer producing 1,000 tonnes of wheat a year will only need a few hundred pounds of this for his family. What he does, in effect, is to swap the wheat he doesn't need for cars and trucks and tractors and new fencing and all the other things he wants for his farm and everyday life. The goods, in fact, produced by the vast majority of Americans who aren't required to work on the land. Just consider these two ways of life and the astonishing fact that they can both exist at one and the same time on our small planet. How can this possibly have come about? Why has this happened in some countries and not in others, even though they may have the same climates and conditions? How can people at a subsistence level ever lift themselves off the bottom rung of the ladder? What's the secret? The secret is producing more than you need for your own immediate use. The point at which a community can create a surplus is the point at which it can begin its long march towards a wealthier life. It's also the beginning of the science of economics.
they say our way of life was called? As if it matters what it's called. Still, if you must know, it's called a subsistence economy. Oh, subsistence economy? It's terrible. I work day in, day out just to keep us alive. Well, it's not just him. Every human being here is just a machine. You fill them up with food and water, and then you use the energy you get from food and water to dig the ground, to plant seeds, to grow grain, and to keep the animals. Then you eat the food you've grown to give yourself energy, to keep yourself alive, to plant more seeds, to grow more food. To give yourself more energy, to plant more seeds. To grow more food, to give yourself more energy. It's, it's a trap, you know. The subsistence trap. <sighs> It needs a genius to get us out of this one. Oh. 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 Come on, kids, run for it! Oh, it's horrible. Oh. 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 oh, no! Oh, that landslide, it's huge! And it's blocked off the whole of the valley. Now we'll never be able to get our cattle and sheep to the only grazing they've got. They'll die, and we'll starve. If we could only get across the river. Oh, just look at that lovely green grass. Enough to make any cow's mouth water. Uh, but we'll never get the animals across that river safely. Mm. Unless we build a bridge. But I only have enough energy to plant the seeds, to grow the food, to give me the energy Oh, we'll to... never build that bridge. What we need is a genius. Wait. I have an idea. Uh-oh, he's got an idea. Everybody round here is like us. They have one cow, and two or three sheep, a few hens, and a patch of ground for corn. They catch their own fish, collect fuel for cooking, build their own houses for themselves to live in, and they make their own clothes for themselves to wear. Though some are better at some things than others. Uh, precisely. Uh, for example, you make the best clothes in the village. Well, we can be quite flattering when he feels like it. Though I suppose it's only because I'm so good at getting good wool from our sheep. The truth of the matter is that the man with the real knack with sheep is our next-door neighbour, Mr Shepherd. Not you at all. Oh, well, that's true. I must be best at something, though. Hmm. Thinking, love. You're very good at thinking. Hey, that gives me an idea. Listen, suppose we alter the system. There are ten families in our village, uh, as it is now. Every household has their own cow and their one sheep. They keep poultry, catch their own fish, grow their own corn, and collect their own fuel. And they do their own cooking. And they make their own clothes. Right. So in order not to waste time walking to the woods to collect fuel, or waste energy by one man looking after one cow, why doesn't each family specialise? What? Divide the labour? Precisely. Division of labour. That's what it's all about. So only one family looks after the sheep? Mr and Mrs Shepherd. They really got away with sheep. And another family sees to the cows. The cowards. They're marvellous. Yeah. Another does the fishing. Mr and Mrs Fisher. And others do the farming, collect the fuel and do the cooking. And we make the clothes for the whole of the village. The tailors. Right. Oh, but that leaves two families over. The masons and the carpenters. Ah, uh, because eight of the families in the village specialise, they produce enough for ten. And that leaves the other two to build a bridge across the river to the new pasture. Brilliant! Yes! Let's put it to the others and see if they agree. Oh. Besides, think of what will happen if we don't do something soon. Yeah, if we don't, our animals will have nowhere to graze. And we'll all go hungry. Well, that's settled then. It worked! <sighs> Who would have thought it? Not only are Mr and Mrs Farmer getting bigger crops than any of us managed on our own, the fishers are bringing in more fish and the shepherds are keeping all our sheep much better.
Not to mention the fact that the whole village is better clothed now that the tailors are in charge. <laughs> <laughs> but what about the masons and the carpenters? They're well fed and well dressed just like the rest of us, but now that the bridge is finished, there's really nothing for them to do. <gasps> I've got an idea. Oh, she's got an idea. Mrs. Farmer over there, she spends most of her time carrying water from the river to water her crops. Well, if the carpenters and the masons could just be persuaded to dig a channel to take the water from the river to the field... Not only would it keep the crops watered, it would save the farmers' energy and they could use that for growing even more food for the rest of us. Brilliant! And that's how it was. When every family did everything itself, everybody was working flat out from dawn till dusk just to stay alive. But now we've hit on division of labour. And we've all become specialists. And we've all become more skilled at our speciality. And as a result, we have a surplus. And that surplus is the mason and carpenter families, or rather, the product of their labour. They've opened up bigger, richer pastures for all our cattle and sheep. And they've given us a regular supply of water, and that means better crops of vegetables and grain. And all this is one of the most important things ever to have happened in the community. The surplus created by dividing the labour. It's the first step on the path to prosperity, and it's a tremendous step. Division of labour by product is at the heart of all progress and prosperity, and it's not hard to see why. Well, just think about the sort of food we eat every day. Cheese from a huge factory in Holland. Salads from specialist farms on the Channel Islands. And that ham is from one of the great Danish pig farms. More than 120,000 pigs a month leave Denmark as pork and ham and bacon and sausages to shops of the world. The bread comes all the way to your table from a great wheat field on a Canadian prairie. Have some tea, Jay. Yeah, the tea comes from northern India, where the villagers make a living by exporting to the rest of the world. By cultivating thousands of acres, they produce tea at a price you can afford. That's another bonus of specialisation, a bonus of division of labour by product. Goods become cheaper. But of course, it doesn't just happen in agriculture. Everything on this table is mass-produced by specialists. Plates, knives, forks, table mats, the lot. And that leads to another step in specialisation. isn't it? Mm. Mm. Remember what it used to be like? What, subsistence economy? Mm. Oh, I'd rather forget it. Working day in and day out, digging, planting seeds to grow the food so that we could eat it to give us energy, so that we could go on and do more digging. And plant more seeds yeah. to grow more food to eat to give us more energy, and so on. And so on. And so on. Ah, but we thought of a way out of that. I'll say. A bit of brain power. That's all we needed. Instead of each family supporting itself by doing everything, we divided up the labour so that each family specialised in what they did best. And that way, the shepherd family got even more wool from sheep because they got better at raising sheep. The farmer family grew even more wheat, and the fisher family brought in even bigger catches of salmon. It's happened with all the families. Mm. And all that extra skill they learnt, and all that time they saved from travelling about from place to place, and all the boring preparatory work they no longer had to do for all the different jobs, meant that eight families produced enough for ten. We had a surplus. And that surplus provided for the needs of the two other families, the masons and the carpenters. 
and they built a bridge so we could feed our animals on better pasture. Mm, then they made an irrigation system that watered the land and gave us even better crops. I suppose you could say the road to a bit of modest prosperity began with that one idea of mine. Yes, I suppose you would. Well, it's scarcely a life of luxury we live, but at least we have enough to know that we and the children won't starve. And we can even lay a bit by for tomorrow. Mm, and have a little bit of time for ourselves and the family to do other things. Like making that shawl? Mm, like making this shawl. That's a nice shawl there. He says nice things sometimes. But the trouble is... Um, sometimes he doesn't. It's taken weeks to make. Weeks. It's true, it did take weeks. Well, two weeks anyway. Shearing the sheep, washing the wool, spinning it, dyeing the thread, weaving it into cloth, finishing it off. So? So it's a lot of effort to put into a shawl. It'll be worn out after a couple of years. It's nice, though. Hmm, that's what I call a wholehearted appreciation. Hey, what's going on over there, then? Ooh. What? He says he's from a village up the river. Oh, just look at all that wonderful stuff he's got in that boat. Ooh. Cooking pots to die for. Oh, yes. Apples. Oh, wonderful red apples. Oh, I wish we had apples like that. Oh. And shoes for the children. Aye, aye. And axes. And knives. <laughs> well, what's he going to do with all that stuff? <laughs> hey? What? He says he's a trader. What's a trader? He says a trader is somebody who exchanges whatever surplus goods he's got for whatever surplus goods you've got. It's true we don't live in a subsistence economy anymore. Ooh, we don't have much to spare. We've got a bit of spare food, but it isn't as good as the food he's got. Our apples aren't half as nice as his. <laughs> hey, what's he doing? Hey, if he thinks he can trade me in exchange for all that stuff, he's got another thing coming. Tell him. Um, he says your shawl is cool. Oh, he likes my shawl, and so he should. Took me weeks to make. He says he needs 20 shawls. 20? He'll give the whole boatload of stuff for 20. 20? They're for the King of Wongaland. He's got 20 wives. Um, what? Uh, if he only gives one of them a shawl like that, the <gasps> others get so jealous his life simply isn't worth living. Do we have another 19 like that? Uh, do we have another 19 like that? That took me weeks to make. Well, two weeks anyway. Oh, he said he'll be back in two weeks. I've never seen cooking pots like that before. Aye, and those apples look delicious. We could have done with a new pair of shoes for the kids. He said he'd give us everything in that boat for 20 shawls. Oh, look, there are ten of us here with a bit of time to spare. But even if we all work flat out, we'd only make ten shawls in two weeks. <sighs> We need a genius to produce another ten shawls. Mm. A genius. Or a miracle. <gasps> hey, I've got an idea. Uh-oh. Why does it take so long to make a shawl? I'll tell you why. Because there are so many processes you have to go through before you can turn what's on a sheep's back into something that you can wear. Oh, first, you've got to catch your sheep. Then you've got to shear it. You've got to fetch water to wash the wool, and then you've got to spin the wool into yarn. And there, there are dyes to make before you can colour your yarn. Then you've got to weave your yarn into cloth, and even that isn't the end. Putting on knots and tassels that give a finishing touch takes ages. Every one of those processes takes ages. You can see why. Setting things up, putting things away again. And even if you're good at weaving, it doesn't mean that you're good at dyeing or spinning. Ah, and that's where my idea comes in. There are ten of us here. Suppose we each did only the thing we were best at. Ah. One will do the shearing, enough wool for twenty shawls. Another would wash it, all of it. Three would spin it into yarn, and one would dye the yarn. Well, that would leave two to weave it and two to do the finishing off. Ah, that means you wouldn't waste time setting things up and putting them away again. Right. And there's something else that could happen too. 
It needs a, a genius to see it. <laughs> Since they're only doing the things they're best at, everybody will get better with practice. Genius. Anyway, why don't we give it a try? Why don't we? <laughs> well, at first it looked like we'd never do it in time. Obviously, the dyers and weavers couldn't start until the dye was ready and the wool was spun, so they helped shear the sheep. It wasn't long before we all got very good at our jobs. Well, we might not have been ready on time if the shearers and the spinners, who finished their jobs quickly, hadn't helped the weavers and the finishers who were getting behind. But we did what we set out to do. And in exchange, we got what we wanted. Oh, oh. lovely. Nice pot. Oh, champion. There you are. And this is how we did it. We divided the work into separate processes, so that each one of the ten of us specialised in just one thing. The result was we doubled our productivity. We produced 20 shawls in two weeks. Before, using the old ways, we would have produced only ten. We'd created the extra ones by division of labour by process. But this time we used the surplus in a different way. We swapped it for somebody else's surplus. And the result is, we've now got a lot of things we couldn't have made for ourselves. What we discovered was the division of labour by process. It's created more surplus. And by trading that surplus, we've taken another step along the path to prosperity. <gasps> All oh. of the cooking I can do with this. Oh, just look at that. There are still quite a few places in the world today where division of labour by process is still at much the same point as in our village community. Some people spin, some people weave, some people finish off the goods. In the modern industrial world, it all looks very different, and so it is in a way, but if you follow manufacturing through, you'll see that it's still divided by process in just the same way, even if it is on a massive scale. The shearing and cleaning of wool is carried out on huge commercial sheep farms. The raw wool is spun into thread on enormous machines with 200 spindles that turn out 23 miles of yarn a minute. The yarn is woven on gigantic electrically powered looms that produce almost an acre of cloth a day. It's dyed in special machines and then made into goods like these, which are sent off to the docks for export. And in return, we get other people's surplus. Beautiful fruit tea and coffee, things we cannot produce ourselves. We don't swap it directly the way our villagers did. We sell our products and use the money to buy the tea, but it comes to the same thing. And it's made possible only because we've created a trading surplus and created it through division of labour by process, one of the foundation stones of the modern industrial world. Am I sitting here? Why? I don't know. To keep warm, I suppose. No. Oh. So you could daydream and carve on a piece of wood? No, no, no. I mean, how am I sitting here? How? You're squatting on a stone. Oh. You have been ever since you came back from collecting the firewood. No, 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 no. You're really not trying to understand me. I mean, how come I've got time to spare to sit here at all? It wasn't so long ago that we had to work from dawn to dusk just to keep ourselves alive. In those days, there was never any question of idling the odd half hour away in front of the fire. Like now? Ah, you've been thinking again. That's right. I've been thinking. 
I've been thinking that once upon a time we lived in a subsistence economy. Then we could never have spared the time to do nothing in particular. Now we can spare a bit of time. Why? Well, that's not difficult. Just think back for a few minutes. Right. I'm thinking. Well, we got out of the subsistence trap by creating a surplus. That's right. And we got that surplus by inventing division of labour. Right. First, we divided the labour by product. We changed from each family doing a bit of everything to one family specialising in only one thing. Say, sheep. Or fishing. And so on. Then we invented another kind of division of labour. Instead of one person making a shawl for themselves, we divided the process between the families. Shearing, and spinning, dyeing, and weaving. We all made twice as many shawls as we were able to before. Yes, we made a surplus. And we traded our surplus for somebody else's surplus. And now we're all better fed. The children are healthier. And we even managed to put something by for a rainy day. And? Yeah? It's your turn to fetch the firewood. <laughs> oh. I wouldn't mind if he did something useful while I do that hard stuff. But all he does is make toys for the children. Hoops indeed. Oh. Oh, oh, six trips to the forest that luck took me. Hmm, his turn now. And what use has a hoop ever been to anybody? Hoops. Come on, kids. Hoops. 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 Ho, ho, ho. Hoops. Woohoo. Hoops. Hoops. Hey, hey, hoops. Look at this! Wheels! Oh. My pile took me six trips to the forest. And mine took one. Show him. Yes! <sighs> well, I'll be blowed. Another revolutionary idea. It's all very well for you. All you have to do to earn your keep is turn grass into milk. How would you like to push a plough? Hey, look at me when I'm talking to you. Well, how would you like to push a plough? Or even pull a plough? Hey, kids, over here! Good girl. Walk on, walk on. You've got to hand it to him. First, he invents the wheel. Then, he gets the animals to do the work for him. What next? Hey, what about the really important jobs? Like grinding the corn that makes the bread, that gives him the energy to make more toys for the children. Oh, hmm, yeah, what next indeed? Uh-oh, I think she's thinking again. Yet another machine. And yet more surplus. In fact, we only had one reason to invent anything. We wanted to cut down the effort we needed to do a job. Then we'd have more energy to spare to make more surplus. More time, too. Hey, then we could even take time off, have a holiday. That's why we invented machines. After all, they're nothing more than devices which make the energy from our muscles more effective, therefore more productive. Every machine, no matter how complicated it looks, is made up from very basic parts. For example, a wheel and axle, a lever, bits of wood, 
put together with one purpose in mind, and that purpose is to reduce the amount of human muscle needed to do any particular job. The next step was to eliminate it altogether by using animal muscle. One horse or one ox has the strength of 20 men. It can do 20 times more work and create 20 times more surplus. But it's possible in the end to do away with muscle power altogether, animal or human. And that's by harnessing the forces of nature. Water power can grind corn. It can also power spindles and looms. But there are more powerful and more useful sources of energy in nature. The wind. Coal. Oil. Uranium. It isn't all that long since we were using simple machines combined with animal power to produce surpluses. Even today in some parts of the world, animal muscle is still the main source of surplus. There are places where animals are still used for freight or carrying passengers and for machine power. Until the railways in the 1830s, a horse was still the fastest means of travel on the land, just as it had been for tens of thousands of years. But in time, the way the machines were applied became more complicated. But no matter how sophisticated they got, there was still only a combination of very simple machines. The wheels and axles on this modern tractor enable it to tackle ground farmers would once never have dreamed could produce any crops. And the gears that make it possible to go up and down steep slopes are operated by levers. Basic machines combined together make it possible for us to turn nature's energy into huge surpluses. But it's only possible to produce surpluses like these when you can draw the energy you need from one of nature's great resources. Until the end of the 19th century, wind powered the fastest method of travel over water. But there was something much more effective than either wind or water, and that was the power of fire. Fire transformed the world.